On November 13th and 14th of 1982, the African National Reparations Organization, a mass organization of the African People's Socialist Party, organized and conducted a world tribunal on reparations for black people. Addressing the question debated across the U.S. today, are African people owed reparations? Listen to the testimonies from this tribunal and you decide. Today, we are initiating a two-day trial of the United States government for crimes it has committed against the black or African population of the United States. Today, we are initiating a two-day process which is remarkable and historic in its implication for the use of international law as a means of addressing the crimes against oppressed people who do not have the benefit of state power and the use of national and international courts which are traditionally only available to those groups who do possess state power. To withhold the right to justice and international legality to the powerless, oppressed African people in the United States would be to validate the most cynical concept that might makes right. It would give credence and validity to the awful concept of the right of the powerful to make and enforce international law. Such law as that is no law at all. It is accepted tyranny. Therefore, this World Tribunal must determine whether international morality might prevail in the interest of the powerless. This tribunal will determine whether, even in the absence of state power, the rights of the oppressed will be recognized as rights which may be respected in the form of applied international law. On November 13th and 14th of 1982, black people from around the United States and the world came together at an international tribunal in New York to hear evidence, historical, statistical, and personal, on the right of black people in the U.S. to receive reparations from the U.S. government. Before an international panel of judges and observers representing popular movements in the Congo, Senegal, Barbados, the United States, and Azania, 14 hours of documentation and testimony was presented to support the charge that African people experienced genocide. This was not a mock trial. International law was laid out and legal procedures followed. This international law consisted of charters and treaties passed by the United Nations after World War II to hold governments accountable to the world community. The judges heard the charges, followed the evidence, cross-examined witnesses, and rendered a verdict. Testimony was put forth under the Convention on the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, which has been ratified by a majority in the United Nations, but which the United States Senate has refused to ratify for fear of being charged before world courts concerning the cases of Native American and African people in the U.S. The Genocide Convention declares as punishable crimes any of the following acts committed with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial, or religious group, killing members of the group, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. The first testimony came from Dr. Leonard Jeffries, chairman of the Black Studies Department of the City College of New York, who detailed the birth of civilization in Africa and the subsequent impact of the raiding slave merchants. For 40 or 50 years, the Portuguese had been touching the coast of Africa, and they knew the riches of the culture and civilizations that had been developed there. The civilizations of Ife and Benin that produced the art, which is as classical as any art ever produced. The civilization that produced the city-states of Nigeria and the city-states of other parts of Africa. These Portuguese, being land poor, resource poor, and people poor, had to have their mind blown when they got to the Gold Coast. So the Portuguese in 1482 came back to Africa and established a permanent base, which became the beginning of the process of genocide that saw 100 million Africans destroyed. That permanent base was called Elmina of St. George. And after that period, hundreds of slave forts were built along the African coast. 
In Ghana alone, along a 200-mile stretch, there are the remnants today of 50 slave forts and castles, some of them only a few miles from each other, as the European blood sucked the African continent. In that 50-year turning point of history, when Europe moved from the periphery of world history, from its dark ages, onto center stage, and moved out African and Southern Asian and Indian peoples, the roots of that which we have to deal with today in terms of the condition of our people are there. They come out of the slave trade system, which, as Walter Rodney says, went to the development of Europe and the underdevelopment of Africans. In this 50-year period of history, you have the basis of genocide, the basis of religious intolerance, the basis of fascism. But I don't want to leave us, historically, with a negative note. The last period of history is 1900 to the present. 1900 to the present is the period of the African Renaissance. 1900 to the present is the period of the African Revolution. And Garvey and others understood this. The revolutions in Mozambique, Angola, and Guinea-Bissau, the revolutions taking place around Anzania and Namibia, the movements in the Caribbean around Grenada, etc., the Cuban Revolution, the struggles of peoples on the streets of Harlem and bedford Stuy. These are all part of the renaissance and rebirth of African peoples. And although a genocidal process existed in history, we are reversing that genocidal process by moving into an African revolutionary consciousness. In addition, a historical brief was submitted with documentation of extensive economic research on the amount of wealth stolen from the labor of African people held as slaves in the U.S. Wealth, which was the basis of the U.S. economy for its first 100 years, and which gave birth to the capitalist economic system. Estimates of wealth stolen from African people's labor through the special structures of tenant farming, wage discrimination, and the dual labor market were also made for the years following the abolition of formal chattel slavery. A minimum estimate of the wealth stolen from black people for labor alone, leaving out charges for damages incurred through murder, maiming, and rape, amounted to $4.1 trillion. Joe Mashariki, chairman of the Black Veterans for Social Justice, brought out detailed information on the use of black troops to enforce U.S. power around the world at the same time that black people are suffering under the rule of that state power in the U.S. The United States government is guilty of mass genocide and degradation against Africans here in America. The economic wealth and development of this country was built on the backs of black slave labor. All persons who enjoy the fruits of the so-called democracy today enjoy it at the expense of black blood, sweat, tears, and lives. As an organization of veterans from World War II to Vietnam War who fought in these wars, our motto is blacks fight no one else's war no more. We have adopted this motto because of our experience in this country. However, this motto doesn't exclude us from fighting our own war. I want to be clear on that. Such as in Anzania, Namibia, Mississippi, or New York. People who know the anti-war movement know that the type of internal chaos that took place in the military which helped to stop the war, and that came from people right here in our communities. The whole um, white anti-war movement couldn't get off the ground until blacks refused. More blacks refused to go into the military during the Vietnam War than whites. Eight to two. Evidence was also brought forth under the International Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Racial Discrimination, which states in part, State parties undertake to prohibit and to eliminate racial discrimination in all its forms and to guarantee the right of everyone without distinction as to race, color, or national or ethnic origin to equality before the law, notable the enjoyment of the following rights. The right to equal treatment before the tribunals and all other organs administering justice. The right to security of person and protection by the state against violence or bodily harm 
whether inflicted by government officials or by an individual group or institution. Testifying on conditions for black people in southern prisons was Richard Mafundi Lake. They wouldn't allow me any reading material for 12 years. They took and put me in a cell, a five by eight cell, without benefit of any writing material, reading material, uh, radio, TV, non-cell mate for 12 years. Only thing was in that strip cell was a, a face basin where you only cold water, running cold water. There was no bed, it was a concrete slab block. And uh, the only time I came out of that cell was to go to a shower for five minutes. And if you wasn't through showering in five minutes, the water was cut off on you. You didn't have any control of the water. That was for 12 years. And the only way I maintained my sanity was to play mental games with myself. I learned how to play chess without a boat. I wouldn't allow them to destroy me. I was placed, I think it was 21 days that I was forced to go without bread or water. Uh, I was in a cell, stripped one at a time, sub-zero deg sub degree weather, and uh, there was no heating, no ventilation. And I was forced to lie on that concrete block. And then the guards would come by for additional punishment and throw water on the floor. It would get so cold that the only way I could sleep, I would just run in my cell until I was just completely exhausted. And I would just fall out from exhaustion and sleep. You see the, t the little blocks in the toilet tissue? They used to give us three blocks, ca actually count the blocks of toilet tissue. And I used to take the three blocks of toilet tissue and lie on that cold flow and put it on my chest and psych myself that I was covering myself with a blanket. You know, under severe conditions, a person play all kind of mental games with himself in order to survive. Further evidence on the government's violation of this international convention was put forth by Akil al-Jundi, who was a participant in the Attica Rebellion in New York. On September the 9th, 1971, at Attica State Prison, there had been a unanimous decision by over 1,200 prisoners at Attica. And that position was that because of all the racism that had existed at Attica and the prison system within New York State and an entire country, that it was a need for something to happen. On September the 9th, 1971, we took to the yard 1,281 strong. On September the 13th, 1971, 43 people lost their lives as an outcome of the rebellion. Now, we know that rebellions go on and on at different times, and what they do is they escalate our particular level of struggle. And this particular case raised the question of prisons, prisoners, and the relationship of prisons to black folk, particularly in the wilderness of North America. There is a suit right now that is pending. And this civil suit is demanding $2.8 billion from the Rockefeller estate because we remember that the governor at the time of the rebellion was none other than Nelson Orridge Rockefeller. And we want to give to the international body our suit so that the world, so that the world will not forget what happened at Attica. And Afini Shakur a member of the Grand Jury Project and former defendant in the New York Panther 21 trial in 1969, brought forth extensive evidence concerning COINTELPRO attacks against the black liberation struggle. My nephew was beginning first grade in 1968, and that was the year of the infamous UFT teacher strike in this city. And here, thousands of children were left without schools, and so people across this city got together and set up alternative programs. The Black Panther Party was very much involved in that, that struggle, and I joined that struggle in 1968. By April 
of 1969, I was in jail, charged with some 350 felonies, including conspiracy to do just about everything there is to conspire to do. We were all acquitted. The state of New York wasted $1.5 million in trying to um, send us all to jail, but their conspiracy did not end there and some of them are now political prisoners. It's important for us, however, to begin by understanding what a counterintelligence program really is. A counterintelligence program is a military operation. One goal of any counterintelligence program is to neutralize a hostile agent. The United States government considers all elements of the Black Liberation Movement hostile agents. When the counterintelligence program was aimed at the Black Liberation Movement, there was only one heading in which all black people fell, and that heading is called Black Hate Extremist Groups. And under that heading fell the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, SCLC, SNCC, CORE, the Black Panther Party, of course, Malcolm X, and anybody that fell any place within those parameters. And that, I believe, covers the general trend existing in any black family and in any black community. Look all around us, people are starving and dying. Time for living, if you're willing, it's freedom time. Yeah. The United Nations has also adopted the Universal Declaration of Human Rights which declares in part that everyone has the right to a nationality. Everyone has the right to education. Education shall be directed to the full development of the human personality and to the strengthening of respect for human rights and fundamental freedoms. Professor Dell Hunter was demoted from position as Dean of Medgar Evers College in New York for supporting the struggle of African students for control of the institution in the interest of the black community. The way that the black intellectual became utilized was literally not to transmit knowledge, not to discover new information, not to engage in human understanding, but literally to reproduce in a very mechanical and a very formal way that information that had been received from the ruling forces. The responsibility, therefore, of anyone who strikes of talking about freedom, liberation, and a revolution is that of creating an antithesis of the present understanding of reality. The idea, the idea therefore, is for the core of people who have been housed outside of the institutions of higher learning, who by the way have usually made more of a major contribution toward the development of black people than those who've been housed inside, okay? The idea is to establish a link and a mechanism so that these individuals have a forum in order to exist and to carry on the information sharing and the understanding that they have. This Universal Declaration of Human Rights also holds that everyone has the right to a standard of living adequate for the health and well-being of himself and of his family, including food, clothing, housing, and medical care, and necessary social services, and the right to security in the event of unemployment, sickness, disability, widowhood, old age, or other lack of livelihood in circumstances beyond his control. One of the many individual black people who came forward to give testimony on her conditions of life and right to reparations was Sharon Smith. One of the unique things about Central Brooklyn is that it's the largest black population in the country, but the majority of that population is made up of women and children. One of the most pressing problems for us as mothers in this city is decent housing. We have a responsibility of providing a decent home for our children. However, it is kind of hard to do that when you're being exploited and oppressed by a criminal landlord further perpetuated by a court system. I've lived in apartments where, well, the ceilings are always falling in. That's common. Rodents, rats, roaches is a common problem. The cold is a common problem. 
in a lot of buildings that I've lived in in this city. When the temperature was below zero last year, we froze. You have on twice as many clothes inside, and you take off clothes to go outside. I was getting a lot of phone calls and letters home from the teachers as such, and he can't be still, my son can't be still, my son is not being productive. And I did not know how to get across to these teachers that if my son go to bed cold and then he wake up cold and he can't wash up efficiently in, in the bathroom that the ceiling is falling in, how in the world is he going to be productive in, in a classroom, in a public school of miseducation, which is another story in itself. We go to housing court and on any day of the week there are loads of people, African people, to be dealing in that system at one time. Something is definitely wrong. I consider that genocide. They're trying to kill our spirits. What it has done is just rise my anger. I want to see justice. I want to see reparations for us. Testimony was brought out concerning the International Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights, which includes the following provisions. The state parties to the present covenant recognize the right of everyone to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. The steps to be taken to achieve the full realization of this right shall include those necessary for the provision of the reduction of the stillbirth rate and of infant mortality and for the healthy development of the child, the creation of conditions which would assure to all medical service and medical attention in the event of sickness. Black health care activist Ibun Adelona testified to the systematic violation of this provision by the United States and state authorities in regards to black people in the U.S. In regards to our struggle for self-determination, we have had to define for ourselves what that means. For us, that means having control over the institutions that affect our lives. It means the ability to define our needs and to have access to resources to develop the social forms that would meet those needs. Generally, throughout the world, infant mortality rates are recognized as one of the most reliable measures of the general health status of a community. Among African people in New York, our rate of infant death is 36.8% greater than that of white New Yorkers. If you compare Manhattan and Brooklyn to Mississippi, you see an even larger discrepancy in the sense that two to three times those numbers begin to appear in other parts of the country. We found that there was a pattern of hospitals being closed in black communities. Now, when you have an understanding of the relationship of business and government in regards to whether or not a hospital stays open, then you understand that when a hospital closes, it is because the government wants that hospital to close. What they do is pull back on the kind of reimbursement that they give to that hospital, so in effect they create a bankruptcy. A total of $10.7 billion was spent in New York City in 1980 for health care expenditures. And $5.7 billion of this was spent on hospital care. Over 50% of that money for New York City, and I'm talking about all five boroughs, went to that string of hospitals in the area that we call Bedpan Alley, which is a predominantly white middle class and upper uh, class community. And we're talking about tax dollars. We're talking about the money that comes from all of us. We're talking about our money is going disproportionately to one sector in regards to the health industry. Following the testimony, the judges retired and determined a unanimous verdict. Speaking on the impact of the tribunal was Justice Ladipu Solanke, chairman of the National United Movement of Barbados. A people who have faced the horrors as outlined in the testimonies of these two days must congratulate themselves to have the moral fortitude to be here for this historical tribunal. Irrefutable evidence has been brought before this tribunal to indict the U.S. government without a shadow of a doubt. African people in the U.S. 
are indeed due reparations from the United States government. The crime against African people in the U.S. is without fear of contradiction, the greatest crime in the known history of human civilization. The verdict of the judges was that, one, African people in the U.S. are due reparations from the U.S. government at the amount of $4.1 trillion, damages to be determined at later tribunals. Two, imprisoned black revolutionaries should be granted political prisoner and prisoner of war status based on the Geneva Convention and other United Nations determinations. Three, U.S. treatment of Africans in the U.S represents a serious enough breach of the United Nations Human Rights Charter to justify eviction of the U.S. from the United Nations. And four, the testimony and documentation presented at the tribunal justifies the establishment of a permanent body to monitor U.S. treatment of African people in the U.S. Calling for the black communities around the United States to take out the verdict of the tribunal and organized chapters of the African National Reparations Organization. Omali Yeshitela, People's Advocate and Chairman of the African People's Socialist Party, summed up the Reparations Tribunal. We've heard testimony and there has been introduced documentation which shows that it is the oppression of African people here and throughout the world which is the very foundation, the cornerstone of the existence of this terrible world economic system that causes destruction throughout this earth. Such being the case, it's very clear that if you remove the cornerstone, the building will come tumbling down. Our oppression represents the cornerstone and at the same time the weakest link in this imperialist country this imperialist world, and therefore the judgment which comes from a tribunal such as this is very, very important. If you live in a country or a world that is built on slavery, barbarity, thievery, genocide, the institutions of that society in any place of the world will be there for the purpose of sustaining the enslavement, and the genocide. We have set about creating another institution, and this institution is a world tribunal which brought the United States government for the first time in its history to trial for the crimes that it has committed against black people in this country. And this tribunal is, is biased tribunal. It is a tribunal that moves off the assumption that black people must be free it moves clearly off the assumption that black people must be free and that anything that stands in the way of that liberation must be removed. America was built, understand, by stolen labor on stolen land. Take a second thought as you clap and stand. Can you rock the house from inside the camp as you move into the beat to the early night? Because you're moving to, moving to the right. Prepare now or get high and wait, cause it ain't no this program was produced by Burning Spear Media, narrated by Dorothy Lewis and Laura Dotson. Senior producer was Gaeta Cambone. Audio engineer was Sandy Thompson. For more information and programs, visit theburningspear.com. <laughs>